Hi, welcome to another edition of Here Now the News on the Off the Cuff Network. I am uh, pleased to have with me today a uh, reporter, anchor, it, been in New York for, I'll well, these as many years. It's already been about 20 years, actually more than 20 years. Jen Maxfield has been in New York. She's been on WABC, ABC7 in New York, and now uh, WNBC, and we'll get into some of those specifics. But she's here today mostly as an author. She has the new book out called more after this, more after the break. Uh, it's about 10 stories that she's covered over the years that she goes back and uh, uh, revisits them and uh, sort of a follow up as they would do on TV. But in this case, it's in book form. Uh, Jen Maxfield, thanks for being with me. Jerry, thank you so much for having me on your show and, and for taking an interest in the book. Absolutely. Oh, here now the news. I mean, it's uh, it it's, comes from uh, Roger Grimsby, the name. So uh, you know, I'm I'm always interested in talking to fellow journalists, and uh, when you know somebody has uh, another opportunity that they decided to go into uh, to do books, it's it's always interesting. And yours, it's it's your own your own life for the last uh, twenty plus years. Uh, you started at Channel Seven. Was that in two thousand? I started at Channel 7 Eyewitness News in 2002. My first on-air job in news, though, was in 2000. You're right. That was in upstate New York in Binghamton. That was my first job at News Channel 34. After that, I went to News Channel 9 in Syracuse and from there to Eyewitness and currently at NBC in New York. And you've been at NBC for how long is that? Uh, 10 years or so? It's almost 10 years. It was nine years back in April. So okay, yeah, it's been a great run. Yeah, it is. Both places. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, how did you decide to come up with the book? I had the idea for writing a book like this for a long time. I think part of it had to do with the relentless pace of local news in New York, which you know all about. We get assigned a story in the morning. We work on it all day. It airs that night. And the next day, the cycle begins anew. And just because the live truck pulled away from the scene, there were certain people, certain stories that I kept returning to in my mind. Sometimes I'd drive past the scene where I interviewed somebody or I'd even have a dream about someone who I'd interviewed for the news. And so really the idea for the book came out of a genuine curiosity on my part on, on what happened to these families who I sat with on their best, their worst, their most tumultuous, the most chaotic days of their lives. So this was all your idea. This wasn't some... Uh, a publisher that said, why don't you try this? This was your, uh, your, your initiative, your idea. It was my idea. And the thing that I think is unique about it is we've all read memoirs by journalists where the journalist is at the center of the story and they covered this inauguration or this natural disaster. And the journalist is always at the center of it. I wanted to change the narrative in my book to put the subject of the story at the center. And I come into their life because that is actually how it happens, right? I mean, things happen before we show up for the news and a whole lot happens after people's stories are on the news. And that was what I was really interested in examining, putting them at the center of the story. So it's, it's like I said, you're revisiting it, following up and, and, and sort of putting the spotlight back on them again. Uh, and it's and it's it's executed very well. It's unique the way you you tell the story from that TV perspective and bringing it to uh, to book form. What, was it hard to put? Uh, I, I don't know if you planned on ten, but was it hard to either settle on ten or to pick those ten? It all looks very organized now, but I always think it's great to talk about the process because there's always a struggle behind whatever the final product is. And it was not as though I had it all neatly organized and here are the 10 stories and everyone's agreed to talk to me. I had and still have a long list of stories that I'm curious about following up on, but the way that I narrowed down these 10 were the families agreed to speak with me and I felt like there was enough variety in the stories that I covered, both when I covered them and the types of stories that they are and that none of them sounded too similar. So the reader, I hope, will see themselves and feel themselves in some of the stories because it's such a wide range of experiences and ages and, and circumstances that the families found themselves in. And look, some people wanted to speak with me again for the book. I'm very grateful that they did. And, and some people chose not to participate. So those stories couldn't go in the book. Mm -hmm. 
What um, I, I know there's there, there's there's a ferry crash, there's um, natural disasters. You have a hurricane that you travel to. Um, is, is there was there one specifically that that stood out even before you went to do the book that you were like, I have to get this one in? I'll tell you about the first phone call I made when I was researching the book, and that was to Corrine Nellius, who's Tiffany Jantel's mother. That story Friday night is featured in chapter three. And people who live, especially in central New Jersey, may recall this happened 10 years ago. A young woman, Tiffany Jantel, who was a huge animal lover. Uh, she rode horses. She had a lot of pets at home. She was heading home on a Friday night and saw an injured dog in the road that had been hit by another car. And she got out to help the dog that was gravely injured in the middle of this two-lane highway. And she actually wound up getting struck and killed there by a drunk driver. And we were called in to do the story less than 48 hours after this vibrant, wonderful young woman was killed because the person who hit her fled the scene. And so her mother, Corrine, was very motivated to bring reporters into her home that day because she wanted the person to be arrested who killed her daughter. But I mean, you can just imagine as another human being sitting with her, someone less than two days after their beloved child was killed. It, it's Those situations are really tough. But I've kept in touch with Corrine uh, a little bit on social media through the years. And I, I felt that there was just more of her story to tell, more about what happens to these families after we air their interviews, after the trial's over. What happens uh, after after their names fade from the headlines? It has to be hard uh, because you're a journalist first, but you know you're human, and I'm sure these these can be very emotional to where the point of where you're, you know, you're on the air and and you're uh, you almost want to react to these. That's I think the tension in storytelling. Look, I, I went into journalism, and I, I'm sure a lot of journalists can relate to this because I genuinely enjoy people. I like meeting people. I like speaking with them. I like hearing their stories. I enjoy learning new things from people and going to new places to do interviews for the news. So I think that being an empathetic person is part of being a good storyteller, and that is part of being a good journalist. So I do think that it's all bound up in the same idea that that we are empathetic people and we're open to other people's stories and, and to listening to them. But of course, we, we also have to balance that with our professional obligations to get the story done by deadline, to speak with other people, to get a full 360 view of the story, and also to safeguard on some level our own emotional and mental health, because I've been doing this job for more than two decades, and, and it's important that as much as we want to be there for families who are suffering, we also need to safeguard our own emotions, and, and maybe that means going for a walk after one of these interviews or talking about it with the photographer in the live truck or not talking about it when I go home that night to my husband and three kids. Right. Yeah. I, I know I've covered not nearly as many, but when I've covered for radio um, you know, funerals or wakes, it's always that, that, that fine line of, you know, meeting people and putting the microphone there to get that sound bite. And uh, are you going too far? Uh, and, and, uh, you know, pushing the envelope where you're, you know, where you're, you're not wanted. Um, but again, those who are interested and willing obviously respond and those who are not uh, don't. And I write about in the book that I take no for an answer. If somebody says they're not interested in doing an interview, the conversation ends there. And I respect that. And I understand that. But more often than not, people do say yes. And I'm very appreciative for that. And I think the alternative is, I, I write about in the book when I was a, a new journalist and just getting started in upstate New York, and even to this day, knocking on somebody's door and asking them for an interview after something terrible has happened to them or their family is unquestionably the hardest part of the job. And it still pushes me far outside my comfort zone. But I think now with the benefit of hindsight and my experience over all of these years, the alternative to not even making the ask is, is really to deny a family the possibility of telling an accurate story, creating a legacy for their person, even something like sharing the photos 
of their loved one that they want out on the news, which I think they, they should have a right to do. So again, if they say no, that's fine. And that obviously happens all the time. But I believe it's part of our obligation as journalists to at least be asking the questions. You went to school for, for journalism, I'm assuming, and, and to, to get into television? I actually started college as a pre-med student. I wanted oh. to be a sports medicine physician. I did a lot of sports growing up and my dad was a doctor and I really look up to him. So that seemed like a natural choice. I saw a posting, I went to Columbia in New York and, and I saw a posting for an internship at CNN at the United Nations. And I wrote for my high school newspaper in Tenafly, New Jersey. I wrote for the Columbia Spectator. I always enjoyed writing and talking to people. But I saw this uh, internship and I thought, well, I don't have class on Fridays, so maybe I'll, I'll go intern at the United Nations. And I worked with Gary Tuckman, who's still a correspondent for CNN. And he is such a fantastic mentor. And he just encouraged me to really do the work, even as an intern, go to news conferences, ask questions, write stories for CNN radio. And I loved it. And so I, I was then a political science major at Columbia. And then I went to the journalism school after my undergraduate years. So you, you didn't necessarily have the TV bug right away. Not necessarily. I actually, what I primarily love about my job is in addition to meeting people is the writing. And you might find it interesting, Jerry, that the, the number one question that not necessarily other journalists, but the general public might ask me about my book is, did you actually write it? And part hmm. of that, I think, is a, just a general misperception about whether broadcast journalists, TV news reporters, whether we are actually writing our stories, which we do. The stories that I report on the news and that my colleagues report, we we write them. Writing is a big part of our job. So it was obviously a, a different sort of writing to be writing a book as opposed to a 90 second news story. But the fact of the matter is, is that writing is, is really the primary aspect of my job that I do every day. But I will say it was pretty different to be writing a book because I have spent the last 22 years writing with the aid of pictures and video. So when you're writing a book, it's completely different, right? I, I wanted to give readers that immersive experience, but I needed to do it all with words because I didn't have the video like I do on TV. Right. So it, it goes back to radio, but instead of doing for uh, a 30 or a minute, uh, uh, now you're doing all the word, the word, what do they call it? Word pictures? Describing <laughs> it that way. And now you're doing a full, like a giant newscast that's, you know, 200 and however many pages it is. I would start pages. some of my interviews when I was researching the various chapters and I was interviewing people for the book. And I would say, I would say, don't feel like any detail is too small. I told them, I like the small details. I want to know what color shirts he liked to wear or what kind of coffee she drank. And I thought, that sort of opening that up and saying there's no such thing as an insignificant detail that allowed me sort of that rich texture of the book where you, I hope, feel like you're there and you feel like you are, uh, you really understand the person. Yeah, I agree. It's very, it's very detail oriented, but it's, it, it's done in such a way that is um, it, it, it's, it's a smooth writing um, like I said earlier, it's very natural. I, I really, it's, um, it's, a, it's, as they say, a page turner. I, I really enjoy it. Um, it, it takes you back, even if you're not familiar with it, you also explain the story for people who, who aren't aware of the stories, obviously. Um, clearly this is all about your, your writing and your reporting for these, uh, for these two stations that we're talking about in New York. Um, are you always a reporter at heart, even though you're doing some anchoring now? I enjoy both. I, I really enjoy the research that goes into some of the anchoring and sort of having that holistic view of, okay, here's the whole newscast and we're going to have this show and, and having that relationship with the producer. Um, I also feel that it's been very helpful as a reporter to have that recognition from the anchoring. I think that when people have seen you and they're more familiar with you because you've been on the news for hours instead of minutes, there is a greater level of trust. And I believe that it has been 
easier for me to get interviews with people when I'm back out in the field reporting because they know me better or they feel like they know me better from the anchoring. Hmm. It, 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 uh, it builds the cachet a little bit more because now you're, you're, you're being seen that more often, much more often. Interesting. Yeah. I just think that it's, it's really a, a pretty visceral <laughs> medium and, and I enjoy that about it. I, I like when people approach me when I'm out on stories and, and they feel like they already know me, or sometimes they'll, they'll say things. A lot of people who are on TV will get this, but they might say something like, Oh, you're so much taller in real life. And I say, well, yeah, on the TV, I'm only this big. So uh, yeah, I, I enjoy when, when I have that relationship with people. And it's one of the reasons that I've stuck with local news all of these years. I, I genuinely like reporting on my community, whether it's my county or my state or just the tri-state area. Um, I like that I have that relationship with the viewers. Was doing the book harder than you expected? It had its ups and downs that I do, as I mentioned, I, I really do love to write. Um, I wouldn't say that every day was a great writing day, but uh, I love the the quote that I, I use in my book, which is that news is the first rough draft of history. So my goal every day was to get words uh, on the paper or on the screen and then to go edit it the next day if I didn't think I was focused enough that day, but to never say, well, I'm just not going to write today because I don't feel ready or I'm not in the right headspace. So that was that was my process. But I would just say on a more macro level, I don't think I could have anticipated when I began writing the book just how much the research and, and the interviews and, and reconnecting with these families would give me a feeling of hope and optimism, which we all needed, right? Because I wrote this book during COVID. And just the notion of spending all of this time with people who've been through really like some of the toughest things that life has to offer. And they've emerged on the other side triumphant and with meaning and with purpose. And, and to spend time with people who've been through that, I found it incredibly inspiring. And, and I hope that readers of the book take that away from it too. So you did this through COVID. So was it all done uh, either on the phone or uh, virtually? In the beginning, it was done mostly on the phone and Zoom. And then once we moved into early 2021 and, you know, people started getting vaccinated and it, it was warmer out and I could talk to people outside. That was when I went and did more of the interviews in person. And then in addition, we talked about sort of the 360 narrative and that immersive feeling. I worked with two incredible research assistants on the book, and we really, really tracked down some very esoteric documents and 911 calls and letters. And I, I think even if you are familiar with the stories or if you remember them from the news, you're going to learn something from these chapters that, that you didn't already know. Yeah, I agree. It's it, it, it it's a fresh take on someone who was already there, um, and and that's what makes it enjoyable. Is there another book in you? Either another part, as you said, you have many stories that that are, were left uh, on the cutting room floor. Either another version of that, or or a different type. Perhaps I I, I never say never, and I I really try to have a growth mindset. I think when you get too comfortable doing something that that's not good. And so do I have another book in me? Maybe. Would I be thinking more along a fictional line next time? Who knows? Uh, I, I will say, I think if I were to try to write fiction, I would probably need to have a little bit more instruction or, or understand a little better writing dialogue because in addition to having to write this book and sort of create those word pictures that you talked about, Jerry, I was not familiar at all with writing dialogue because we never have to do that on TV, right? We just run the sound bite. So uh, yeah, I have a lot to learn, but I think that's what makes life interesting is to do something new and challenge yourself and see how it goes. Yeah, you can't do a book and just put sot, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> sound on tape, sot, okay. Right. <laughs> Um, what else can I ask you? I don't have anything else I really want to ask you um, uh, other than, you know, specific things with the book. But I mean, I don't want to go delving into it too much because I want people to get the book for themselves. It, it's, a, it's a great read. You can really, you can spend, if you really want, a few hours and, and just 
you know, take the time or milk it and, and you know, and, and read it piece by piece, chapter by chapter. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, because, you know, it's one of these books when you get to the end, you, you wish there's more. Well, that that's a very nice compliment, Jerry. I, I appreciate that. And I just hope that your listeners know that that again, the book is the final product and and I hope people read it and enjoy it, but I also hope they appreciate uh, the struggle that that went into it. and and really all along, I, I was recently interviewed and, and I was explaining that I think throughout my career and really my life, I've, I've been very motivated by rejection. And I think that's been incredibly helpful through the years, especially in a, a career like TV news. Look, it, it all started. I remember when I was in high school, I I uh, did not get into any of the colleges that I wanted to. Uh, Columbia, believe me, was a great option, but it wasn't my top choice. And then when I went to try to get my first on-air job, this is back when we had to send out VHS tapes right? You'd have to mm -hmm. actually mail the VHS tape that you made a copy of like 60 times. So I mailed out 60 resume tapes on VHS. I didn't get a single call back from a news director. N nobody wanted me to work for their station. I wound up taking advice from another reporter friend who said, just take a, a road trip and call them when you're in town and, and ask if you can have 10 minutes. So all of that. And, and then even now, I'm a first time author. So there have certainly been plenty of emails that, that I've received in the last two years that started with, I'm sorry, but this is not for us. Or I'm sorry, but we're not interested. And again, it, it's sort of getting back to that growth mindset of just being able to get into a place where you can accept the rejection and sort of use it to fuel you going forward for whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. And even when you left uh, uh, Channel 7, and then uh, you went to NBC, one door closes and another door opens. Exactly. And I think if you take that attitude, whatever your your career or whatever's happening in your personal life, I think if you can just be comfortable with being uncomfortable, and look, nobody likes to be rejected for something, right? Nobody likes for things to not work out. But if you can sort of train yourself to accept that and move forward, it, it can be very empowering. Well, it's uh, it, this has been an empowering few minutes, and uh, I'm glad we could talk again. It is called More After the Break. There's the lighting there. Uh, a reporter returns to 10 unforgettable news stories. Jen Maxfield, WNBC-TV for New York. Again, thank you for your time. And uh, hope I, I know it's number one, I think, on Amazon on the, uh, what is it, the, the, the TV communications category? It, it, Amazon updates a couple times a day, so it, it goes in and out, but <laughs> there's a few categories that I tend to crop up in, um, social sciences, references, journalists, um, there are a number of categories, but I, I'm, I just hope that people enjoy reading it as much as I enjoy researching and writing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. It, it's great. And I uh, hope people uh, take it, you know, buy it. And you can find it, obviously, on Amazon. Again, it's Jen Maxfield, more after the break. Well, not sure. literally this case, but uh, <laughs> thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for taking the time and the interest, Jerry. It was great to talk to you. Same here. Uh, and that's it for this time. We'll be back again soon with another, another episode is coming soon right here on the Off the Cuff Network. It's Here Now the News. I'm Jerry Barmash. Thanks again to Jen Maxfield. And have a great day.